And so I'm going to pray. Anybody ready for the word of the Lord tonight? All right. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to start praying for Journey in Redmond that Pastor Luke's launching this weekend, and then we'll pray about the word of God getting into our hearts tonight. Is that okay? You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to kneel. You're welcome to sit. Whatever you want to do, let's get our hearts ready to receive the word of the Lord tonight. Father, tonight we come to you, and we thank you, God, for your goodness in your church, Lord. We ask, God, as we sang tonight, that you open up the gates, Lord. Father, may the blessings of God pour out. May the spirit of God pour out. And Lord, with those gates being open, God, may many people come to know who you are, but also to receive that wonderful gift of salvation and come in to a living relationship with Jesus Christ, giving you all their hearts and all their lives, God. We pray for it here. We pray for it in our state and our nation, God, and all over the world. And Lord, this weekend, God, another church is being planted. What an awesome thing that is. But not only that, God, it's one of our own, Lord. And we bless Pastor Luke and Stacy, the family, Lord God, all of our members that move their whole lives up there just to be a part of what you're doing, God. And we would bless Journey Church in Redmond as it starts and as it launches, God. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you give them wisdom, you give them favor in the community, God. We ask that you give them a place to meet on Sunday mornings. Right now they're meeting Sunday afternoons, and that's okay, God. But Lord, the goal is to get them early in the morning, Lord, like church Uh, Many people want to have a church on Sunday morning. So we thank you, God, that you will open doors no man can close. You'll close doors no man can open, God. You give them favor and provision, God. We ask for every financial resource that they have need of, God, every physical resource, God. We ask for great volunteers to surround them, Lord, and people who will carry the ministry further than they could ever do on their own. And, Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for longevity. We thank you for goodness, Lord. We thank you for unity and oneness in the body of Christ. And we bless them tonight, God. Not only them, God, bless all the churches that are gathered gathered in your name tonight and throughout this weekend, Lord. There are brothers and sisters, and we thank you, God, that you're moving in the midst of your church. Lord, bless the persecuted church. Encourage them and strengthen them. Deliver them. And Lord, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Tonight, Lord, we silence our souls to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Tonight, we have not come to hear from a man or a woman, young or old, black, white, brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, teach us, lead us, guide us. Give us your wisdom, direction, correction that we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you praise and we'll give you glory. We'll give you honor. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. 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 Tonight, as you're having a seat, I've got two titles for the message. I just couldn't decide which one was better, and so I figured I'd go with both. First title for tonight is The Path and the Protection of God. I figured that if somebody was looking up a message online, and they were trying to find something that was going to speak to their life, that it would be The Path and the Protection of God. But then my my second title for tonight's message is simply this, and this is maybe for the younger generation, for some of the people who, you know, path and protection, yeah, that's cool and all, but I'm calling it boulevards, bridges, and boundaries. Can somebody say amen to that? (laughs) Boulevards, bridges, and boundaries. We live in an information age, don't we? In fact, as I was typing the words information age in my notes, it corrected me and capitalized it. You know, when it capitalizes something like that, it's a thing, isn't it? You know, now all of a sudden that's a thing. Like I was typing into my notes the other day, a little rock, and it capitalized it like Little Rock, Arkansas. That's a thing, right? That's a place. So as I'm typing in information age, it was lowercase, but it said, no, 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 you you don't get it. This is not just something. This is a thing now. It is the information age. And we're all constantly looking for information to do what? To better our lives, aren't we? We're constantly Googling something. We're constantly looking up something. We're constantly trying to find out something. Some people are looking for self-help, right? They, they just need to get the help that they need, and so they want peace. They want peace of mind. They want, uh, you know, better practices. They want best business practices, right? Many people are looking for the right diet and exercise regimen to look good and to feel great or to lose weight, whatever it is, right? That's, that's a thing. It's a big thing, in fact. You'll find whole sections of Barnes & Noble filled with books on diets and exercises. There's all these latest things, the latest fad, paleo and keto and uh, ketosis and, and the intermittent fasting is kind of being the new thing on the rise. And there was the Atkins and the South Beach and all that kind of stuff just to help people out. And you can get all this information online or anywhere you look. Some people are looking for the right bed to sleep on, right? You want to make sure that they get the right rest so that they can feel good and have the energy that they need throughout the day. 
Some people are looking to declutter and to organize their home in order to be at peace and unattached to things that could cause them stress. In fact, whole Netflix series have been made in our day and age just on how to declutter your house and find things that spark joy, right? And that, that kind of became a catchphrase for a while. I don't like that. It doesn't spark joy. Get rid of it. Get it out of my house. It's almost like the, the zen or the, the new thing, the, 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 the different ways that people set up their homes. Now they're decluttering and they're getting rid of things in order to de-stress declutter, and feel better about their lives. But can I tell you something? In our information age, I believe that we're missing the greatest thing that we could ever receive, and that is God's commandments. So that God's commandments are for our life. God's commandments are for our good. That God gives us not just information beyond anything else. If this was just information, we could just read this on our own. We could just go home tonight. We could just look it up. We could just Google it and find it on the Internet. Many people search the Bible like they're searching for just information. When there's not just information in this world, there's revelation. There's something much greater. There's the heartbeat of God, the way of God, the direction of God. God wants us to have not just a life. Jesus said, I came to give you life, but not just life, life more abundantly. God wants you to have a blessed life, a big life. God wants you to have a life that just goes beyond your expectations God wants to exceed anything that you could even ask or think. God wants you to have a great life. Somebody ought to say amen to that. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you want to turn there with me, the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, Deuteronomy is an interesting book. Most of the books of the Bible, you can kind of get what they're talking about by their name. Genesis, right? Genesis means a beginning. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Exodus, talking about how the people came out of the land of Egypt. You know, we know that term, there was a mass exodus out of that place, right? There was a lot of people that left that place. Leviticus, talking about the priesthood that came from Levi or the Levites. Numbers, they numbered the people. Pretty simple book, right? But then you come to Deuteronomy, and it's like, what is that? Is that the study of something, the study of dudes or something? I don't know what that is, you know? It's kind of like this random book. But Deuteronomy literally means second law. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, you don't find another law. It's not a second law that comes. It's a repetition of the law. It's Moses preaching sermons to the children of Israel. And beyond just the letter of the law that was given in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers now, what is he doing? He's preaching. He's breathing out. He's speaking out the heartbeat, the character, and the nature of God behind the law. And I believe that's why it's called second laws, because we can miss out just on the information if we stop there and not get to the revelation of the heart of God and who God is and what God is all about. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 17 says this. It says, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. He says, not just keep them, but I want you to diligently keep them. Keep what? Keep his commandments, keep his testimonies, and keep his statutes. In fact, you'll find variations of this all the way throughout the Old Testament where he talks about the commandments or the statutes, where he talks about the precepts, the ordinances of what God has to say, his testimonies, as well as his statutes. But the problem with the casual reading is that we will only live by what we understand. Let me say that again because you've got to get a hold of this before we go any further. When it comes to a casual reading of the Bible, we will only live up to what we understand. That means that if you don't understand what it is that you're reading from the Word of God, it will not have the effect that God wants for it to have in your life. In fact, the Bible says that when we don't understand, Jesus was giving a parable about the Word that was sown into the heart we were discussing with our staff this afternoon. And when the word is sown in the heart and the person does not understand, immediately the devil comes and steals it out of the heart. You will not receive the blessing. There will be no fruit produced if you don't understand. And so when we read a passage like this that says, you shall diligently keep his commandments. We understand commandments, right? Right? If God commands something, God says for us to do something, that's a command. So we say, okay, I've got to diligently do what God says. And we'll stop right there. But then he goes on to say, and his testimonies. Well, we kind of know what a testimony is, right? Well, that's something that happened in my life that, you know, I was one way before and then something happened and I was another way afterwards. And we think of that as our testimony. But what about God's testimonies? What is that all about? And then his statutes. 
what is a statute? I mean, like, that sounds like a legal term. I don't really understand. And we kind of just skip along, and we miss out on something that God has for us. Uh, you know, I heard the joke of the thief that was walking into a house one night. It was dark, and he had his flashlight, and he was coming in to steal anything that he could. And all of a sudden, he heard a voice that just caused the hair on the back of his neck to stand up. And the voice said, I see you, and Jesus sees you. And he whipped around, and he looked around, and he said, who's there? Who is that? And he didn't see anyone for a second. And the voice came again, I see you, and Jesus sees you. And he turned around, and he said, where are you? Come on, show yourself. Finally heard the voice one more time, I see you, and Jesus sees you. And he turns around, and he sees a birdcage, and there's a large parrot on the inside of the birdcage. And he relaxed for a second, and he thought, oh, it's just a parrot. And as he relaxed, his flashlight went down, and there was a dome pincher pincher on the ground. And all of a sudden, the parrot said, sick him, Jesus, sick him, attack. <laughs> See, I think sometimes... When we take a look at the commandments of God, especially when we're in the Old Testament, we almost think about the commandment as like, sick them, Jesus, right? Get them. Just make sure that they do what I say. Make sure that, that they just follow anything that God says. That's just the commandments, that God is some rule book to us. And yet, the commandments of God go so much further. Because I would suggest to all of us that the commands, the testimonies, and the statutes are actually the boulevards, the bridges, and the boundaries of God. They are both the path and the protection of God for our lives. So tonight I want to just start with one of these, okay? And anytime I'm ministering on Wednesday night, I'll come back to the other ones. But let's start tonight just with the commands, the commands of God. I'm going to put this up on the overhead, just a simple definition of the commands of God. The commands of God are His way for us. Don't you just love God? He doesn't make it so hard. He doesn't, he doesn't try and, you know, mess it up for you or make it really murky or unclear. God just says simply, if you do what I say... That's a commandment of God, right? Remember, we all could define it pretty easily, pretty simply. A command is just doing what God says. God commands it. God says it. The commands of God are his way for us. Can I put it to you like this? The commandments of God are the boulevard. Now, if you've ever driven down the boulevard, right, the boulevard is usually a large street. In fact, by definition, a boulevard is not just a wide street. It's a wide street that's lined with trees. Isn't that kind of an interesting thought? It's both big and beautiful. Come on, somebody. Don't you just love cruising? Some of you guys like those old cars, right? Back in the day, they would go and they would cruise the boulevard. What were they doing? They were just enjoying the wide expanse of road that they were able to drive on. And as they drove down that big, beautiful road, there was trees lined in it, right? People hanging out. Man, Southern California at night, it just gets so great. It might be dead hot during the day, but all of a sudden as the sun starts to say, you can cruise down the boulevard at night and just roll down the windows, put the top down, open up the sunroof, the moonroof, whatever roof you got, right? And, and, and just enjoy the California night. See, that's the picture I get of God's commands. God's commands are a broad way, but also they're a beautiful way. God gives us his commandments so that we can have life, but not just life, an abundant life, a big life, a beautiful life. See, sometimes we look at a Bible and we think, my goodness, this thing is so thick, right? I got a thin line Bible and it's still thick, right? We look at this thing and we say, gosh, how could I ever get every commandment of God in my life? Anybody ever feel overwhelmed when you look at the Bible? Like you, you, you decided one year, right? January 1 comes around, I'm going to read the entire Bible this year. And you plop that thing open on the table in front of you and you start Genesis chapter number one, verse number in the beginning, God. And you're like, mm, yes, Lord, Right? Just give me some more of that, God. And you start to go throughout the Bible, and you, you go through Genesis, and man, all the stories, it was exciting, it was fun. Then you get to Exodus, and, and let my people go, right? And you're envisioning Charlton Heston. You've got these great visions in your head, or maybe you're a little bit younger, and, and it's actually the cartoon guy, you know, with that, with that one dude's voice behind him. And so a little bit different, but you're, you're still moving on through it, right? And you get this great story of them coming out, and then all of a sudden, you hit the commandments, right? You hit the laws, you hit the description of the tabernacle, and you're going, why am I reading this? And, and as you start going through more and more commandments, more and more things that God commanded the children of Israel to do, it, it's just slowing you down and slowing you down, and you get through Exodus finally because you started it. You're like, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to do this in this year. I'm going to go through the Bible. And then you hit Leviticus, and Leviticus is like the graveyard of Bible reading, right? Here lies this year's 2020 Bible reading plan, right? 
Leviticus chapter number one, because we just go, I don't understand. I don't get it. What is God talking about? And how could I possibly know how this applies to my life? How could I possibly do all this? Does this even apply now? We're, I, I live New Testament. I mean, Jesus went to the cross, and, and yet I'm reading the Old Testament and wondering, do I even need to understand this? Do I even need to know this? And many of us are that way, and yet God doesn't want us to be bogged down and burdened. Remember I said God's commands are just his way for us. And if you understand that when you get into Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and all throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, when you realize that there are commandments in the New Testament, in fact, Paul told Timothy several times, command the people this, command them to do that, command the rich, command the people. In fact, he wrote to Titus, he said, command them, strictly say to them these things because they're Cretans and their, their name, Cretan, right? If you call someone a Cretan, that's like a put down, Right? He says, they've got a reputation, therefore command them, exhort them, tell them these things. Oftentimes in the Bible, you'll find that there are commands, but simply it's God's way for us. It's a broad way, and it's a beautiful way. And when you realize that about the Bible, when you see that in the Word of God, and when you realize that this is really talking about Jesus, and it's talking about our relationship with Him, and those commandments are the way of God for us, it makes Bible reading so much greater and so much better. Thankfully, Jesus simplified and summarized all of it for us. If you want to turn with me to the New Testament now, Matthew chapter 22. Turn there with me in the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Jesus is being tested by the Jews. Matthew 22, I'm going to read verse number 37 down through verse number 40. The religious leaders have come and they've got a lawyer and they question him to test him. They say, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, that Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Did you know that he's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy there? Jesus, in the Gospels here, is quoting Deuteronomy, the second law. Not just the letter of the law, but speaking it, declaring it, and allowing that to be the wonderful Broadway, beautiful boulevard for our lives. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. In other words, if you want to summarize everything all up in one commandment, this is it. But then he goes on, he says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I'm so glad that he included that in verse number 40. And the reason why I'm so glad for that is because simply this. He says, everything that you read in the Old Testament law, you can hang it on these two commandments. It's the coat rack by which they hang from. It's the nail which holds them up. It's the securing place that props all of these things up. In other words, what he's saying is, as you read the Old Testament law, recognize and realize that you can summarize all of these commandments, everything that's said in there, with one thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Remember, his commandments are his way for us. His commandments are his way for us. If you want to summarize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those first five books of the Bible, which were considered to be the law, then just simply love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then he adds something, right? It was so simple, it was so easy, we just had one thing. But he says, wait, 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 wait. But the second is like it. The neat thing about that is that that second commandment is actually very similar on purpose. The first one was simply love God, but the second one is this, is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. So if I could put it to you like this, very simple, very easily. The commandments of God are simply this, love God and love others. Love God, love others. If you can remember three words because love is repeated twice, right? Love God, love others. You know, in your life, there's only going to be three categories of people. There's you, that's one category. There's everybody that's not you, that's another category. And then there's God, right? Three categories. So, you're you. And even though Jesus says you got to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So you do have to love yourself. But he makes it very, very simple for us. Just simply, the people that are outside of you, love them. Love God with everything you got and love your neighbor just like you love yourself. That's the commandments of God. If you want to summarize, and that's why he said the law and the prophets, right? All of those books 
that you see. Now, in the Old Testament, we also have the history books. We have, uh, you know, the Chronicles of the Kings, and, and you've got all of the historical books, Ruth and Esther, and uh, all the different things that took place in Nehemiah, right, and Ezra. You've got the historical accounts of what took place. But also you have the wisdom literature and the poetry. But at this time, those things were compiled, yes, and they were part of the Old Testament, but they didn't have the Scriptures like we have them today. And so it was very important that they study the law and that they study the prophets so that they would know how to live. So Jesus takes all of that that they were studying to know how to live, and he sums it up in two things, love God and love others. So for all of us today, the question is begged then, right? I don't know if this is how your brain works, but this is how my brain works. The very first question that I ask is then, how do I love God? Anybody else ask that question? Because it's very important. If that's the commandment of God is to love God, then I need to know, God, then how do I love you? Because I want to make sure to do what you say, because if I'm going to ride on the boulevard, if I'm going to enjoy this big, beautiful life that you planned for me, then God, I need to know how to do it the right way. Is anybody listening tonight? So how do I love God? Okay. John chapter 14. I'm glad you asked the question. Turn there with me. In John chapter number 14. You're there in Matthew. Keep going back. A couple of gospels to John. In John chapter number 14. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross He's having a long conversation with his disciples. In fact, this conversation spans three chapters of the Bible and includes some prayers. It's an amazing portion of Scripture. And in it, Jesus starts to lay out expectations. He starts to give vision for the future, starts to set up things that they need to do in their lives. And in it, he starts to describe how to love God. Now, I'm going to go through these Scriptures quickly tonight, all right? John chapter 14, verse number 15. Look at what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commandments. So the commandment of God is to love God. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How do I love God? Keep his commandments. Second verse that I want to point out. Verse 21, drop down with me. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In other words, you're going to have an intimate experience with God the Father and Jesus the Son if you will do what his commandments tell you to do, to love God and love people. Okay? Next scripture I want to submit to you. John chapter 14, verse 23, and verse number 24. This time Jesus defined for us what he's talking about when he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my commandments. Verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my commandments. I'm sorry, what's, what does it say? Word. Say it one more time real loud. Word. He will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my what? Word. Words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Jesus said his words are his commandments for our life. That means that anything that Jesus said, and by the way, Jesus is the word. He is the logo. So anything you find in the Bible, that is simply a commandment for your life. That's the way of God for your life. But Jesus summed it up for us and made it simple for us. Love God and love others. But that doesn't mean that if you find something in the Bible that talks about cleaning up your mouth, which you will find that in the Bible, that's a commandment for us. It doesn't mean that if you find something about not getting drunk or never being out of your right mind, being sober-minded, the Bible says. So I don't care if they legalize it. I don't care if it's okay. I don't care if you're of age. I don't care if it seems good to everybody else that's doing it. I don't care about none of that. My Bible says a commandment to me that I'm to be sober-minded and not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that right? That's a commandment to me. A lot of people get off, well, can I drink? Here's the deal. I don't care how far you want to get close to the edge. Just don't, you know what I mean? People think, well, can I get this close to the edge? Can I get that close to the edge? How about this? Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you can't handle that commandment, it'd be better to abstain. But if you're saying, well, I just have a drink at night with my dinner, then you're okay if your conscience doesn't condemn you. Is that right? As long as you can stand before God, God is your master. He's the one that you're going to have to deal with, not me, not my theology. It's his theology, right? And so if your heart doesn't condemn you when you have that drink and you're not getting drunk, then I'd say you're okay. But if it's a thing for you and you're going, well, I just need to know so that I can get right up to the edge, I can get buzzed and a little sloshed, it'd be better just to abstain. 
You hear what I'm saying? Because it's not about the letter, it's about the spirit. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Love the Lord your God. Can you lovingly say, I'm doing this? Hello. Awful quiet in this church tonight. Maybe we'll get you shouting by the end. When we simply do what we know from the Bible, God equates that with loving him. Isn't that interesting? When we simply do what God tells us to do in his word, God equates that with loving him. See, we thought love was a song, lifting our hands. It was when you actually had tears during praise and worship, right? Oh, that's got to be love. Yeah, that's definitely love because the Bible says to worship him with singing. That's definitely love, but that's not the only way to love. Loving is when you are kind. Loving is when you do what God tells you to do. Loving is when you walk in obedience. Loving is when you do clean up your mouth or clean up your act. Loving is when you do what it is that you've learned from the Word of God that it tells you to do. Little by little, piece by piece. You don't have to live up to it all at once. It's not like you get saved and you get handed the rule book and do all of this now. No, God is gracious and loving with us and He's patient and long-suffering and He's kind with us. And He waits for us and He watches us as we grow up and mature. And if you're living to the level of understanding that you have, that's loving God. And if you continue to grow in the things of God, then you will love God more and more each day. Can I tell you, after 25 years almost of being a Christian, I'm still growing, I'm still learning, but man, my love life with God is getting better and better, and I hope yours is too. Can somebody say amen? 1 John 5, verse number 3, you just read John 14, but now this is John writing to the churches in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, he says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, the reason why I pointed out that it got quiet is because sometimes we hear about cleaning up our acts. Sometimes we hear about these things and we get under such condemnation and and we, we start to read the Bible and we feel like it's a burden rather than a blessing. But God never intended his commandments to be something that is such a burden. Notice what it says. His commandments are not burdensome. Jesus said, come and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, it's easy. When you've got Jesus yoked up with you, when you're linked up with Jesus, he bears the brunt of the weight of that. He bore the weight of your sin on the cross. You don't have to bear the weight of that anymore. If your sin is off of you and onto Jesus, that weight is no longer on you. So what's the burden? The burden now is is to learn of him, just to follow alongside of him, to go in the direction that he's going. And as he says, hey, we're going to turn here. Hey, we're going to go over there. Hey, the boulevard curves around. You're going to make a left right here, right? As you go his way... The Bible says his commandments are not burdensome. Loving God and loving people is not a burden. It is a blessing for your life. Love makes the command a delight rather than a duty. Let me say that again. Love makes the commandment a delight rather than a duty. You can delight in what God says. You can delight in the things that God gives you. When you're reading the word, man, there should be a big smile on your face, especially when you learn something new, when God points out something, a way that he wants you to live. And I understand, you know, because there's times where I read the Bible on, oh, man, do I feel down, because I'm like, I am not doing that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I really need to, to, to straighten up here. This is really hurting me. You know, the Bible says that it's like a mirror, that when we look at it, we see how we look. And sometimes when we look at ourselves and when we get a real picture of who we are, we don't like what we see. And yet, if you see it, The Bible says that you can clean it up, right? But the people who hear the word only and don't act on it are like people seeing their face in the mirror, and then they leave and they forget what they looked like. In other words, you had egg on your face. You had pie on your face. You had mud on your face. Big disgrace. (laughs) I'm glad that we have some people who know that reference. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate you guys. But here's the deal. If you don't do something about it, don't clean it up, you'll never like the way you look. And eventually, you'll avoid the mirror. Come on, somebody, are you listening tonight? So, loving God and loving others. How do I love God? Simply do what he says. The more you learn, the more you do. The more you do, the more of a blessing it is and the less of a burden it is. So how do I love others then? That's the second thing. How do I love others? We define love here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center very simply. Love is personal self-sacrifice for the benefit of of others. Can I, can I have you guys say that with me? Love is personal self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. One more time. Love is personal self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. It's not my needs at your expense. That's selfishness, right? 
That's personal selfish desires. That's lust. My needs at your expense. I'm going to take. I'm going to grab. I'm going to just get whatever I can out of you. I'm going to use you, abuse you, and then I'm going to lose you, right? That is lust. But love says your needs at my expense. So how do I love others? Well, that's where you see what others need. You take the initiative, and at your own expense, you help them out. You bless them. I think in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, it gives us the most comprehensive, most extensive definition of love in the entirety of the Bible when it comes to other people. I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. It'll be up on the overheads, but I would encourage you to find it in your Bible, underline it, put a star next to it, dog ear the page, write it on a post-it note, put it on your mirror so that when you're brushing your teeth, you read it, tattoo it backwards on your head so that when you're looking in the mirror, you can remember this, all right? Whatever you got to do, get this on the inside of your spirit. Make sure that you can get back to it. Put it on a note, put it on a tweet, put it on an Insta post or do something with this, all right? First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Remember, it's not, not your needs at my expense, right? Not, no, I'm sorry, not my needs at your expense. This is your needs at my expense. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It's not just, oh, there's another one. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? I'm never going to let that happen again. That's not loving. It's not what God's talking about. It keeps no record of being wrong. Verse 6, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Can I tell you something? That's, that's especially when it comes to us. Sometimes we're more concerned with being right than allowing truth to win out. Get an argument with your family member, get an argument with your friend, right? And you just want to be seen as right. You want to be proved I'm the right one in this. And yet God has a truth that supersedes our own right. Are you listening? And that's where we lay down our right to be right, and we say it's better that the Word of God that says that love overlooks an offense, love covers sin, it keeps no record of wrong so that I don't have to be right, but I can walk in love. Keeps no record of wrongs, does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Verse 7, love never gives up. Love never loses. Faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. If you're having a problem with people, let love lead you on. Because when we approach this in the natural, when we approach this in the flesh, we'll give up on people. We'll stop with people. Well, we won't forgive people. We'll hold that against them for the rest of their lives. We'll quit on people, right? We just won't show up, and yet love will continue on. Love will lead you further than you thought that you could ever go. How do I love others? Personal self-sacrifice for the benefit of someone else. What did we learn tonight? We learned that tonight that God has boulevards, He's got bridges, and He's got boundaries for all of us in our lives. The commandments of God are simply what God tells us to do. It's God's way of life. And that in God's way of life, Jesus summarized it for us in two things, to love God and to love others. How do I love God? By simply doing what he says. God equates that with love. And when I know the word of God and I add that to my life daily, I'm now doing the commandments of God. And how do I love others? Personal self-sacrifice for the benefit of someone else. Can we pray together tonight? All right, come on. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for your word, Lord. We thank you, God, that you've given us commandments, that you've given us a boulevard, a way to live our life. God, you've given us a pathway through life, that as we travel on it, God, that it's a broad way, but it's also a beautiful way. And so we thank you, God, that you've given us your commandments in your word, and that, Lord, we're learning them and we're growing in them, God, and that we're going to continue to do them as we see them from your word. Lord, tonight, God, as we're here in this holy moment, in this place, I pray, God, that you would just speak to your people about the word that you've delivered to us tonight. Tonight, while we're praying, would you just take this time and say, God, what are you speaking to me through this word?
You know, I love what the Bible says. Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, if you don't understand something, ask God. He'll make it clear to you. Maybe there was something in the Word that you just didn't understand. Maybe even though we preach this message tonight, there's still something that's lingering. That you say, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. Would you just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, the teacher, to reveal that truth to your heart right now and listen for his voice. Maybe tonight God is revealing to you his command for your life. Maybe he's brought back a scripture you hadn't thought about in a while. Maybe it's a scripture that you've only been able to think about for a while. Tonight, would you just commit to God that you're going to do his commandment? Maybe tonight God's revealed something in a relationship and he's saying, you're doing well loving me, but you're not doing well loving someone else. And he's asking you, will you lay down your right to be right? Will you give of yourself? Will you bless someone at your own expense? Can you be patient with them, kind? Maybe tonight he's asking you to strike the record. You've had a list of wrongs and tonight it's time to forgive it and put it under the blood of Jesus. What's God speaking to you? If you got a word from the Lord, something that God spoke to you, just write that down. Maybe God revealed the scripture or something like that. Just write that down. I know if I don't write stuff down, I will lose it. It's gone. And so I want to encourage you, if God did speak something to you, to just commit that to a note. Maybe you got your smartphone, you want to just take a note, or you got a pen and paper, or write it in the leaf of your Bible. Just go ahead and do that right now. If you're here with a faithful friend, maybe a spouse, you want to just whisper that to them. This is what God showed me. This is what God told me. Maybe you want to show them your paper, show them your phone. Hey, look at this. Will you hold me accountable to this? Will you remind me of this? Or I just want someone to know what God's speaking to me. Go ahead right now. You can talk to them about it. Show them that. Father, we thank you for your word. We receive it with meekness. Ready to submit. Lord, thank you for your commands. They're life. They're your way, God. And we're grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, did you guys get some from the Word tonight? Hallelujah.